June 30, 1931. A portly man sits before the defendant's stand in the Chicago Federal Courthouse, nervously wiping his brow with a white handkerchief. An employee of the Internal Revenue Service rises to the witness stand and begins to drone on about missing tax returns and unreported income. Without context, this scene appears about as mundane and boring as can be. However, millions more recognize this court proceeding for what it is, the technicality that allowed the United States justice system to finally catch the most notorious mobster of all time. Indeed, to many, the era of the speakeasy, the Tommy gun, and the illicit bootlegger need no introduction. But how did criminals like Al Capone grow so powerful? Welcome to the latest video in our series on organized crime, where we will explore the origins of the American mobsters and explain how the era of prohibition allowed them to become some of the most powerful criminals in world history. Our story begins in the late 19th century, the beginning of a massive wave of immigration to the United States. As war, poverty, oppression, and famine rocked their homelands, millions of Irish, Southern Italians, and Eastern European Jews crossed the Atlantic in search of new opportunities. In 1892, the iconic Federal Processing Station on Ellis Island opened its doors. But as thousands of migrants passed through its crowded lines each day, they soon found that the United States was not quite the dreamland they hoped it to be. Nativist sentiment was strong amongst the upper crust of American society, and many movements sprung up as a result. These cultural conservatives claimed that the United States was founded upon the principles of an Anglo-Saxon Protestant society and had no place for the Jews or the Catholics. Consequently, new migrants were often denied respectable jobs, forced to perform menial labor while being crammed into slums like the infamous Five Points in New York, where poor families were stuffed into homes built atop landfills amidst tanneries and glue factories. Most immigrants made the most of the hand dealt to them and worked hard to provide for their families. Others turned to more insidious means to make ends meet. The story of organized crime in America begins as early as the 1830s, with the rise of a handful of predominantly Irish gangs in the slums of New York. The most prominent of these gangs was known as the Dead Rabbits. Based out of the poverty-stricken five points, they arose as a defiant movement against class oppression imposed on poor Irishmen. Consequently, their main rival, the Bowery Boys Gang, was a xenophobic posse of Protestant American-born nativists led by Bill the Butcher Poole. The gangs fought street battles with knives, hatchets, spiked clubs, brass knuckles, tomahawks, and muskets, and their conflict became an inspiration for Herbert Asbury's 1927 non-fiction book The Gangs of New York and its movie adaptation by Martin Scorsese. The most prominent leader of the Dead Rabbits was John Old Smoke Morrissey, a professional boxer who had made his fortune in prize fights, even becoming the champion of America in 1853. Morrissey soon took his violent lifestyle to the streets of Five Points, having his most bitter rival Bill Poole gunned down in a Broadway saloon in a morbid statement against anti-Irish activism. In the following years, Morrissey had become the king of New York's gambling scene, owning racetracks and clubs that attracted such prestigious guests as Mark Twain, John D. Rockefeller, and Ulysses S. Grant. Morrissey was soon so influential that with the help of the Democratic Party political organization known as Tammany Hall, he was elected into the United States Congress in 1867, where he always looked out for the Irish, using strong-arm tactics to accomplish his goals. The story of his life left a dubious legacy. Felonious violence was a valid path to wealth for the disenfranchised immigrants. Throughout the 1880s and 1890s, new waves of Jewish and Italian migrants would arrive to carve a place for themselves in the streets of New York and beyond. Out of Manhattan's Lower East End, a charismatic thug named Monk Eastman knit together an insidious order made up predominantly of young Jews from Brooklyn. His organization became known as the Eastman Gang, and he became a local kingpin in gambling, prostitution, opium dealing, and violent extortion. Eastman's main rival was Paolo Antonio Vaccarelli, known better by his Americanized name, Paul Kelly. Styling himself as a sophisticated gentleman, Kelly made a name as a dexterous flyweight boxer. Riding the fame of his victories in the ring to open up several brothels and clubs, he eventually cobbled together the largest and most vicious Italian mob in New York. By 1901, Kelly and Eastman's cronies were locked in a bloody turf war in the Lower East Side. 
Consequently, the two gangs were also in the pocket of Tammany Hall, who used the violent mobsters to further their political goals in the New York State Legislature through bribery, extortion, and voter fraud. In order to enforce a peace between the two, Tammany Hall organized a boxing match between Kelly and Eastman to determine the fate of their gang war. The two mob bosses beat each other bloody for two hours, but the match ended in a draw, and the war resumed. Not all the gangs in New York were started by impoverished laborers. Some had deep ties to well-established secret societies which had been formed in Italy decades earlier and carried over to the United States by its powerful criminals. Two of these groups were the Camorra and the infamous Cosa Nostra, whose rise to power in 19th century Sicily we have covered in a previous video. Meanwhile, Irish gangs held out against the Jewish and Italian advance. Morrissey's Dead Rabbit Society had long since been absorbed into the Five Points Gang, but many Irish factions that remained united to form the White Hand Gang, named in juxtaposition to the Italians who practiced a form of extortionism known as Black Hand Violence. It should be noted that not all these gangs were divided entirely on ethnic lines. For example, some Jews served under the Five Points Gang, while some Italians worked for the Eastmen. Plenty of Irishmen, alongside Poles, Slovaks, and other marginalized immigrant communities, were present in all gangs. At the turn of the century, the foundations had been laid for an era of lawlessness in the heart of the United States. But it would be two decades later that a certain constitutional amendment would pass, allowing the mobsters of America to explode in prominence and initiating an age of criminal kings, who ruled by right of barley, hops, and rye. Dating back to the colonial era, America was a nation that loved its liquor. In lieu of access to clean water and unable to afford tea and coffee, the beverage of choice for the average Yankee was a nice cool tankard of beer. However, it was also a nation founded by Puritans, so its society had civil watchdogs who decried the effects of the alcohol, namely the rise domestic abuse and substance addiction and a dive in the physical and mental health of the average working man. In 1873, a group of disgruntled wives, who had long suffered at the hands of their drunk husbands, formed a society known as the Women's Crusade, whose prayers and songs against excessive drinking rang out throughout the nation. The anti-alcohol sentiment grew in the following decades, as temperance movements soon evolved into the total prohibition of any and all alcoholic beverages. The leading organization in this was the Anti-Saloon League, whose relentless lobbying soon had turned most of the United States Congress to their side. By the winter of 1919, the Great War was over, Charlie Chaplin was rising in popularity, and lively jazz clubs rocked America. On paper, the economy was booming, however, the nation would soon be shaken to its core. The federal government, under pressure from anti-alcohol abolitionists, passed the 18th Amendment to the United States Constitution, the era of alcoholic prohibition had begun. As saloons, taverns, and distilleries across the nation shut their doors, Puritans from coast to coast celebrated the beginning of a golden age of Christian righteousness and virtues. In reality, by taking drink out of the hands of legal businessmen, they had thrown it into the clutches of the shadowy gangs that had been developing in the country for nearly a century. Throughout the 1920s, almost every major city became the home of some form of criminal organization that supplied its population with alcohol in defiance of the law. Before long, America was full of illicit establishments known as speakeasies, in which bootleg alcohol flowed freely. Al Capone is one of the most recognizable names in American history, and his repeated presence in this video should surprise no one. Born in Manhattan in 1899 to a pair of poor Italian immigrants, he dropped out of school at 14 to join Paul Kelly's Five Points gang, working as a bouncer in one of their saloons. At 18, he was savagely attacked by a knife-wielding patron in a dispute over a woman. The assault left the young gangster with three grotesque serrations on the left side of his face, which would give birth to his infamous nickname, Scarface. In 1919, he moved to Chicago, where he found work under the mob boss Johnny Torrio. Torrio soon retired and handed his criminal empire to Capone, which the young gangster proved to be exceptionally capable at running. By 1927, the portly mob boss was the undisputed king of the Windy City, having made a fortune off hundreds of underground breweries, distilleries, speakeasies, racetracks, and brothels he controlled across the entire greater Chicago area.
His main rival was George Bugs Moran and his Irish Northsiders gang. Back east, a new generation of ambitious crime lords had emerged from the old gangs and divided New York amongst themselves. Arnold Rothstein's origin story was unlike most mobsters. The son of a businessman of high standing and the younger brother of a rabbi in training, the Jewish youth took a darker path than the rest of his family, delving into the world of gambling and blackmail. It was even alleged that he managed to fix the 1919 Baseball World Series between the Chicago Red Sox and Cincinnati Reds by bribing the Red Sox to throw the game. When Prohibition became law, Rothstein turned to illegal alcohol to make his fortune. By 1925, he was one of the most powerful crooks in the country, forging a criminal empire based out of Broadway and becoming the largest bootlegger in the nation. Charles Lucky Luciano Dietsch was born in 1897 in Palermo, Sicily, as the son of a poor sulfur miner. In 1906, his family emigrated to New York. As a teenager, Luciano fell in with the Five Points and came into the employ of a faction of the Cosa Nostra, led by the ruthless Giuseppe Joe the Boss Masseria. Unlike other Italian-American gangs, the Sicilian Cosa Nostra was staunchly conservative, refusing to work with non-Italians and even reluctant to work with non-Sicilian Italians. This young, Americanized Luciano was shocked when his old Sicilian-raised boss referred to his good friend Frank Costello as a dirty Calabrian. Calabria was right next to Sicily, and anyway, they were both Americans now. Luciano soon began to dream of a new world order where Jewish, Irish, and Italian gangs alike could breach racial lines and work together and enrich one another in defiance of the government. At the height of prohibition, mobsters across the country were suddenly making exponentially more money than their predecessors. Before, the gangs had been limited to immigrant neighborhoods in the poorer parts of cities, but Prohibition had transformed them into high-flying international businessmen. It now became commonplace for every major crook to hire lawyers, accountants, real estate investors, and shipping contractors. By the mid-twenties, the most powerful of kingpins were spending the equivalent of seven million modern U.S. dollars a month on bribes alone. Still, they remained violent, merciless criminals, using brutal methods to maintain control over their territory. Before long, it became evident that those who lived by the Tommy gun would die by it. Even the most powerful of bosses were far from untouchable. In 1928, Rothstein was gunned down during a meeting at the luxurious Park Central Hotel over an unsettled gambling debt. In Chicago, the escalating war between Capone and Moran reached its crescendo on St. Valentine's Day of 1929, when seven Northsiders were openly murdered. This brazen, borderline public execution shocked the American public. And even though everyone knew the portly Scarface gangster was behind it, no court had enough evidence to convict him. In October of that same year, Luciano was ambushed and forced into a limousine where he was beaten, stabbed, and strung up by his hands from a wooden beam in a storehouse. Despite all this, he lived, thus earning his moniker, Lucky. All these acts of violence quickly soured public opinion of the booze runners who committed them. No longer were the likes of Capone seen as righteous Robin Hoods, supplying the people with alcohol in defiance of an unjust law. The veil was lifted, and everyone saw the gangsters for what they truly were. Nevertheless, the power of the American mobster continued to grow. In 1931, Luciano murdered his boss Masseria and defected to the organization of his biggest rival fellow Sicilian Salvatore Maranzano. Maranzano consolidated control over all the major Italian crime families in New York and declared himself capo di tutti capi, boss of all bosses. However, young Luciano was not content with second place and that same year hired the brutal Irish hitman Vincent Mad Dog Call to take out his new boss. With Maranzano out of the picture, Luciano became the most powerful mobster in the country and finally ushered in his new world order, spearheading the formation of the Commission, a unification of all of America's major Italian crime families. For his efforts, Luciano came to be known as the father of organized crime in the United States, creating a confederation of Italian-American gangs across New York, Boston, Chicago, and Philadelphia, while also promoting open cooperation with Jewish, and to a lesser extent, Irish outfits as well. Despite moving away from the political conservatism of the old Cosa Nostra, the new American Mafia Confederation created cultural unity by following a strict set of rules that originated in its Sicilian heartland. 
This included the adoption of Cosa Nostra initiation rituals, hierarchical structure, and the famous policy of Omerta, the Code of Silence. In 1931, Al Capone was finally caught and jailed on charges of tax evasion. However, his arrest was almost inconsequential in the overall struggle against organized crime. By now, the Mafia had tendrils in every level of American society, and Capone was just one drop in an ocean. By the beginning of the 1930s, Prohibition was rapidly losing support in Congress and amongst the media, as it became evident that all it had done was usher in an age of corruption that the law was helpless to combat. In 1933, the 18th Amendment was finally repealed, and alcohol finally became legal once more. However, the criminal empires that Prohibition had enabled continued to grow in the decades that followed, diversifying their focus into illegal gambling, loan sharking, drug trafficking, and puppeteering labor unions. Some of these gangs are still active today, and while Prohibition has been over for nearly a century, it is clear that organized crime in America is here to stay. Our series on the history of the criminal syndicates will continue, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button.